Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Brenda Haug and I'm the facilitator for today's session. We have two very special guests with us today. Mick Jacobson and Toby Greenwald are from the Skokie Public Library in Illinois. And they're going to be talking about staff technology skills and creating a culture of learning. As we begin, let me quickly tell you about the technology we're using today, ReadyTalk. You should be hearing audio now through your computer speakers or headphones, whichever one you're using. And if that's not working, if it's choppy or just the sound quality isn't good enough, there is a phone number you can call in to too, and we'll put that in the chat so you can use that. But hopefully for most of you it's working well through your computer speakers or headphones. I'm going to put a can you hear us now message on there so um, we can help troubleshoot if there are some people who aren't actually able to hear us yet. Okay. Another thing about ReadyTalk is chat. Lots of you are using chat already, which is great. That's how we'll interact today with you, and you can ask questions there, share your experiences. If you have a resource that you think would be relevant to everyone, please feel free to share it there. And we'll be, we'll have a, we have some time set aside at the end of Mick and Toby's presentation for questions, but actually we'd love to have you ask those questions throughout and we'll, we'll answer them as, as they fit with the flow too. One thing that people often ask is, is this session being recorded? And the answer is yes, it is being recorded. And later today we'll send you a follow-up email and that will have a link to the recording. It will also have the PowerPoint slides. And then any websites that are mentioned today or that are discussed, we'll include those in the follow-up too. So no, no need to try to write those down or capture them. Anything that's shared, even the things that are shared by you, the participants, we'll be sure to include them in that follow-up message. Okay, well as we begin, I'll tell you about the groups bringing you today's session. I work with TechSoup for Libraries, which is part of TechSoup. And TechSoup, if you're not familiar with it, is an organization that helps nonprofits and libraries use technology to serve their communities. And TechSoup is one of the organizations that is part of a coalition called the EDGE Initiative. And that's what today's session is about. Here's the EDGE Initiative and the website for the EDGE Initiative. It's being funded by the Gates Foundation and it's being led by the Urban Libraries Council. And the EDGE Coalition has been developing a toolkit with best practices and resources to help public libraries assess where they're at with public technology services, and then also make plans for improving. A big part of this is benchmarks that have been developed. And there are 11 benchmarks in three categories. You can see the three categories here on this slide. And you can see as you look at that that it's not just things like the number of computers that you have available for the public or the amount of bandwidth that you have. Those, those things are in there, but this is, these benchmarks are looking much more broadly than that. And these benchmarks are the basis of the EDGE assessment tool. And that's something that's going to be available nationwide in January 2014. But pilot libraries have been testing it, including Skokie. And, um, Mick and Mick and Toby are here because they're one of those pilot libraries. Today's session is based on one of the benchmarks, Benchmark 8, which says this, that libraries have sufficient staff with technology expertise to help patrons achieve their goals. So this is Benchmark 8. And again, we'll include resources. We'll include a link to Benchmark 8. We'll include a link to a, a kind of paper version of the assessment tool that you can look at now at, in order to think about or prepare for that January launch. But again, we'll include that in that follow-up message later today. But with that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to our special guests, Mick and Toby. I'll let you introduce yourselves and I'll have you just take it from here. Welcome. Great. Oh, thank you so much um, and thank you for the, the warm introduction. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, my name is Toby Greenwald, um, so hopefully you can recognize the dulcet tones of my voice. I am presently the Virtual Services Coordinator at Skokie Public Library. And my name is Mick Jacobson. I guess I don't have dulcet tones. I am presently um, the supervisor of adult computer labs. 
all of that is changing, though, right now. We're in the middle of kind of a realignment uh, kind of spurred around some of the, you know, the assessments we've been doing about the library and some strategic planning stuff. So all of that is going to be thrown out the window very shortly. Um, so, you know, we're trying to build, you know, and a lot of the stuff we've done leading up to this has kind of helped contribute to that. And, and that's kind of what we, were, we really wanted to talk about today. But first, given that it's Halloween, we wanted to start um, with something kind of scary. Um, so brace yourself. Oh, there it is. Um, you know, we tried to think of the scariest thing we could come up with. We couldn't come up with anything. We were kind of beating our heads against the wall. And then I came across this image on Tumblr, and you know, the rest kind of speaks for itself. So I hope you guys aren't all so terrified that you don't sit down and continue to enjoy the rest of the presentation. But um, we just had to put that out there. Um, but on a related note, our efforts to find a scary image to kick things off is kind of similar to our struggle to really say something concrete about staff training. Um, we've, we've worked really hard to make learning such a pervasive part of the staff culture here at the library that it's, really, it's often difficult to really separate out what we actually did to get to this point. Um, it reminds me of the joke that David Foster Wallace uses to start his commencement speech, uh, this is water. Um, in the joke, there's you know, these two younger fish that are talking, and an older fish swims by, and you know, he asks, hey guys, how's the water? And the two younger fish turn to one another and go, what the hell is water anyway? Um, and that's kind of a reflection of where we are now. You know, we've, we've um, integrated you know, training and just a, an approach to learning um, into just kind of everything we do here at the library. And so we had to really think back and reflect on what makes, uh, what makes the library, you know, what, how, we, how we built a, a training model. Right, how do we cultivate a learning culture? Exactly. And so, you know, hopefully we've identified some of those things for you. Um, the, you know, it's a little different from what libraries like anything have done. You know, this is, you know, of course, kind of the flagship for, you know, the sort of participatory librarianship, you know, creating something that's a very comprehensive model for how, page, how public and staff interact with one another. Um, you know, they've rebuilt their entire organization more or less from the, long, from the ground up. And different from that, we're, you know, we're a big standalone library with a lot of legacy services and staff. So it's really been kind of a big ship to turn around. So we're going to talk about how we've kind of integrated a lot of different methods, kind of using the staff we have and then the resources that are available to us. Um, you know, both little things, you know, whether it's just you know, small questions that we're asking people, or big, large, formal training programs that we've done that have kind of helped to introduce new concepts to staff and just drive home the fact that trying new stuff is a, that they're in a, that people are in a safe environment to try new things. Um, you know, from our perspective, we try to give we try to give people the tools to support one another, and once they get the understanding, they can go and run with it. You know, libraries, after all, are learning organizations, and you know, knowing how to learn really plays a big part of that. And you know, we want to reinforce throughout all of this just the variety of methods we've employed. You know, there's no single magic bullet at right. work. I mean, you can't even like get a 3D printer and print out a magic bullet because <laughs> Well, there's a good chance it may not even print out right. Right, because you have to calibrate the magic bullet first. Right, yeah, there's a whole thing. Um, rather, it's like this mix of like big kind of formal efforts, and then there's like smaller, sneakier methods of integrating an awareness of new technology or you know a, a way to approach way to integrate the tools into current services um, that uh, you know th that really makes things click. You know, maybe sometimes. Um, uh, where was I? Yeah, I mean, so we're here to provide kind of an overview of how those methods work. And you know, just reflecting on the edge benchmarks, you know, because this is not an overly, the edge benchmarks aren't overly pres prescriptive in dictating how you fulfill them, um, you know, it's up to you to determine the best approach for your organization to meet this goal. So I mean, when you say you know, libraries will have sufficient staff training, Maybe that means you need a formal training program where you need staff that need a lot of hand-holding, where you walk them through, you know, first you do this, then you do this, and then voila, you've written a tweet. Um, or maybe you can do things in kind of a more ad hoc set of discussions, you know, where everybody comes in and we say, okay, show us what you're good at, and then let, you know, let the other staff members learn from one another. Maybe all you need is like a technology petting zoo where people can come in and just really get some exposure right. to the gadgets at hand. You know, um, 
you know, it, so you know, your mileage always varies depending on what you've got. And so, you know, with all of this, you really have to kind of filter it through your own prism. You know, don't do it just to fulfill the edge benchmarks. Really, pursue staff training as a way to make your organization better. Um, so we'll be going through these examples in a fairly rapid fire manner because, again, every library has its own spe uh, has its own specificities. And we really want to get as many questions as possible. Yes. I don't know if it was mentioned that the, the Twitter hashtag is hashtag TechSoup, so we're going to be monitoring that as well as the chat, of course. Yes, and we're hoping to leave for at least 15 minutes at the end for Q&A because I know it gets into that very specific stuff quickly. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to, to respond to as many things as we can. So please think of questions. Don't hesitate to leave them in chat now so you don't forget them because um, our friends hosting will make note of them and we can bring them up uh, later if we, if we miss them. So, and likewise, if you see something in the chat and you have your own answer, please jump in. Right. You know, a healthy back channel really is the key to enjoying a good presentation, you know, beyond just hearing the dulcet tones of our voices. And even any presentation, yeah. um, because we're not promising to be good. Right. Um, so let's get started. Um, the uh, you know, a big part of training staff on new technologies really requires making an honest assessment of what it is they need to know. You know, before you even start, um, you know, it's like a question, you know, what do we know? What what don't we know yet? And what what is it that our patrons you know want to understand that, that we're not we're not fulfilling? And that's really the first real secret. You know, you've got to talk to people. Right. You know, it's I know it's I know it's scary, but it's it's something you really have to get out. And of. not just the people who are coming to your desk. Right. That that's what the five percent of the population you serve. Right. You've got to get out there and really talk to people and more so listen to people. Yeah. And uh, and you know, you've got to ask, you know, it, questions to really kind of prompt a response. You know, the way we do reference interviews to stuff out. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the real details we need? You know, things like, you know, what does your staff feel nervous about? You know, what is it that your patrons are actually using? You know, right. there's lots of Given the the move to people are more bringing in their own devices, what are the devices you see? You know, we've seen a definite transition from people bringing in, like they say, ebook readers right. to tablets. You know, tablets all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can do this. You know, in formal fashions, you can you know do like you know create some kind of protocol where you have a specific question that you have your staff ask people, or you can design a survey. Um, but I'm really actually a bigger fan of using. Just kind of informal gatherings mm -hmm. with regard to staff. You know that that you know the break room is just a fantastic place to really talk to people. Or the water the cooler. If you don't yeah, the water cooler, or you know those hallway conversations mm -hmm. that take place. Um, and you know you can even do this uh, kind of indirectly. You know if you don't want to, if you're not, you know, cause obviously you can't be there all the time because supposedly we all have other jobs to do. Uh, but you can do, you know, set up like a graffiti wall. You know, just get like a thing of butcher paper and leave it on the table with a question, and right. use that to kind of drive some kind of asynchronous conversation mm -hmm. when you're when you're going through things. Um, and you know, there's it doesn't have to be literal questions. You know, it's like you know, instead of just like what technology are you most curious about, what gadgets are your kids using, you can take a more sideways method. I'm a big I'm a, I'm a big fan of Brian Eno, the musician and the the record producer and a long time ago, he developed this, this deck of cards called Oblique Strategies, and they're basically prompts that encourage creativity. You know, mm -hmm. It's like a way of introducing limitations into a creative environment so that your imagination can be sparked. You know, when, often when you have an unlimited palette, you, know, you get frozen by indecision. And so, and so that's what, kind of what informs you know, some of the other questions. You know, it's like, what skills do you wish you had? You know, name a technology that scares you. What do you think, you, you know, what's going to change about your position in five years? You know, sometimes taking a more indirect approach can really result in some more illuminating answers. And, you know, as far as, you know, using this to build a learning culture, you know, your ultimate goal is really to not just have a direct, you know, you talking to them all the time, mm -hmm. but more getting your staff talking and sharing ideas back and forth. Um, you know, and with all of this, there's a good chance you're going to end up being a victim of your own success. You know, to be perfectly honest, you're going to end up getting a bigger array of responses than you really know what to do with. Right. And that's kind of the other secret. You don't have to do everything all at once. You know, there's always pressure to, oh, you know, Pinterest is big. Let's Pinterest, put it on Pinterest. Yeah. <laughs> 3D printers are awesome. Let's buy a MakerBot. You know, you don't, 
you know, part of making an effective plan for serving your public is choosing, you know, what needs to be given priority and what needs to not be given priority. But having these conversations can really go a long way toward helping you set those set those priorities. And of course, you know, keep in mind that just because you don't you choose not to do something now doesn't mean you can always you can't always get to it later. And if you choose not to do something doesn't mean that you can't learn about it. You yeah. can't research it. You, the, I can't emphasize that active researching a topic is the learning as well, even right. if you don't end up buying 30 Chromebooks or whatever it is. Exactly. Uh, so I mean, with that in mind, you, know, you can then you know, work on developing a formal approach. Um, I'm going to actually skip a slide um, and talk about, you know, I'm a really big fan of experiential learning. You know, I find that people learn best when they actually take the time to do the project themselves. You know, you can sit there and you can, you know, it's like give a man a fish and you teach him for a day, you teach him how to fish and, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera, if we'll all have lots of fish. Um, you know, we, we were a big fan, we were big fans of the, the 23 Things program that was started in, uh, in North Carolina. And we implemented one of our own back in 2007 called 10 Things and because we just, you know, we concentrated it down. Into right. The best 10 things. Yes. And you know, these, of course, were the things that were a big deal at the time. But as in, a, in terms of getting all the staff involved, it ended up creating this platform where everybody could try all of these things in a safe space, send one another questions, and then also help one another out. You know, knowing that in week three we are talking about instant messaging, you could get groups of people who say, oh, let's all get online at the same time and set up a chat. And you'll, see, and you'll see in the next couple of slides, a lot of the 10 things on here are going to be, we, we, we will revisit them within specific projects. Right. I mean, there's a fluidity to all of this. I mean, these were all, you know, some of these things, you know, social bookmarking, that's, you know, with delicious fading into obscurity right. and, and things like that. And with the attempts to pull RSS away from wider use. My cold, dead hand. Right. And that's exactly. RSS for me. You, yeah. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that, you know, strong assessment will help you. Uh, Will help you determine which things to really focus on. So I'll jump back to this other sorry, thing. Um, this oh, is yeah. from 2007. Has it been updated since then, or is that something you did at that time, and now you've been trying other things since then? We've been trying other things in different ways since then. Um, we're actually working on developing a new kind of staff training to represent the library's realignment, mm -hmm. and we'll have, we'll have, you know, it'll be very different from what it looks like right. now. But uh, the ten things was a jumping off point and you'll see from within that there we that was the the baseline knowledge and then we mm -hmm. we we grew the tree from that. Right. In library school I was in a program a networking class where we built computer networks and the instructor's style was he'd sit down and he'd lecture he'd you know, we'd each have a computer, we'd take it apart and end up with a big pile of, you know, circuit boards and RAM chips and cables and et cetera. And they'd say, Okay, so now you see all the parts go put it back together and then he'd leave the room. Right. And kind of giving people that sense of working without a net, you know, really it, it kind of unlocks, you know, it's an empowering move because people realize that they know more than they think they do. And, and if they don't, they learn on the fly. Cause, right. Because uh, then they turn to one another. Right. I, I, and I suppose the biggest takeaway is libraries are an organization that learning, to learn is the most important thing. Right. And I, the future of libraries is self-learners. Right. This is another learning program we did uh, called Video Boot Camp. Um, the, that one is, it was what, blogs.skokielibrary.info slash boot camp. I think so, yeah. And that was, a, that was really one built around creating and editing videos for the library. So imagine 10 things, but just about video production. Right. And we had staff on hand to walk people through. You know, we, built, we broke it down into simple steps, kind of like we did with the 10 things, whereas instead of, you know, one week you did, you know, one week you did wikis, and the next week you did podcasting. Here it's like one week you write out a script. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn how to fo create a concise message and focus it down. Next week you write a storyboard. You know, and so by breaking things down into smaller, more digestible chunks, you can help people learn much bigger, much bigger things. And we actually um, converted this to a program that we did at the Illinois Library Association conference for two years running where we had people running through this program in two days and creating their own. And you know, we had staff at all levels coming to us. We ended up making 
know, probably a couple dozen videos altogether right. with, uh, across those two years where people would come in and, you know, grab and a camera and go. Stuff. Yeah, we'd check out, flip cameras to them, and then they'd go and, and do it. So basically we learned all the people we needed to hire. Yeah. Because they're the ones who came and asked for cameras and wanted to do experiential learning. And then we poached them, and yeah. it was delightful. <laughs> um, moving on, though, you know, the, and that goes back to this idea of really building projects around learning. The other kind of more insidious motive behind having video boot camp was it enabled us to kind of create a pool of videos that, you know, helping people, um, you know, really build stuff. And, you know, we've, we've looked to other programs. This came from a gallery ex exhibition we had of Caldecott art, and we thought, you know, let's set up a photo booth where people could pose with their favorite right. Caldecott books, and we can superimpose this out. And that was a learning exercise for people to learn how to, you know, create good photos, how to use the green screen, the, the portable green screen we have, and then how to, you know, pull all the parts together using GIMP or Photoshop or the other right. tools. So this have. specific project was um, we had the Caldecott display of art, and we invited a lot of people to come and view this beautiful artwork. And one of our librarians, Brad Jones, said, hey, um, what if we set up a green screen and took pictures of them, and then we superimposed the background of their favorite piece of art and then give that to them? Yeah. And we got lots of, like dozens and dozens of great photos. You can look at our Flickr pool if you like. Um, so w the whole idea of building projects around learning is like, okay, projects are patron-based. You're, you're building stuff for for patrons' delight. This is a delightful thing for patrons to do. But within this project, Brad and other people learned the basics of green screen lighting, which is not easy. You know, you do three lamps and stuff like that, and you've got to set up a green screen, and then you've got to take the picture, and then you've got to edit it. And how many, he handed, a couple of people added a dozen. Now we have a couple green screen experts on staff. Yeah. And we can, we can, we can build on that. Right. Because it was their idea, you know, if, if they're self learn self teachers, but, um, other people saw this and said, this is awesome, and they want to do it. Yeah. And they want to learn it as well. And the nice thing about this, and you know, because oftentimes, you know, when you're dealing with staff, you're going to get people who say, oh, well, how is this going to be useful? You know, how are, what are patrons going to get out of this? This was a case where the, the service dictated the technology as opposed to the other way around. Right. You know, you yeah. said, oh, we've got this calendar card to do it. Why don't we set something up that, you know, why don't we do something fun with it? Right. And that's where we started to incorporate, you know, the green screen elements in the photography. Right. So I want to be absolutely clear for all the people who are starting to roll their eyes. We do not build projects around the tech. We build um, both. We do involve the tech in the projects. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll go into augmentation a little bit later, uh, augmentation of, with technology of projects. Well, let's go through a couple of other examples right. of how we've done that, you know, where the technology really, well, the, the project really provides the context for learning technology. Right. This is something called BookNet, so Reader's Advisory Survey sort of thing, like uh, quite a few libraries have it. Yeah, if you're familiar with, like Barry Trot's work, mm -hmm. you know, where you fill out a big extensive survey outlining your reading preferences. Right. This is our adaptation of it. So I was on the reference desk the other day, and I was talking to um, one of our uh, uh, colleagues, who's, her name is Sophie. She's um, self-admittedly not a tech person. And I was talking about how I was going to use this in this talk, and she says, and I was saying, well, you, when you learned Bookmatch, you learned how to edit wikis, you learned how, how to convert things to PDFs, you learn the basics of WYSIWYG on what you see, what you get editing, which is what you need for blogging and everything else like that. So you learned a lot of technologies. And you learned about around surveys and skip logic. And just to be clear, the, the back end of the book match is once they fill in the survey, right. we paste it into a wiki, and then staff work collabor collaboratively to make a list of about two dozen recommendations for the patron based on their preferences. Right. And um, she, wrote, she told me, sometimes I learn stuff and I don't even know what it's called. Because, you know, she, she learned how to edit a wiki. That's not a small thing. That's web design right. in some ways. You know, she, she learned what a hyperlink is. And she didn't even know what it was called. She just did it because she was suggesting books or something. So this is a perfect example, I think, of, um, of experiential learning and building, yeah. project, um, building technology into projects. Because we could just have a, Word, a Microsoft Word document. It wouldn't work nearly as well, but everybody would know the technology already. But it's a, it's a, for me, it was a, a better tool. Yes. Another project we did are, are in the midst of is called Skokie Stories. This is an oral history project. A lot of people are do oral history projects or um, some sort of archiving projects. We decided to um, do ours through video and audio, and one of the main reasons was that. So, you know, we get to keep people's voices. There's a lot of good reasons for video and audio, of course. But one of the main reasons for me, was so my staff, and, and I said my staff, well, when people, my colleagues, would, um, we would 
learn how to aud edit audio. We would learn, we'd buy MP3 recorders, and we would learn how to use those. We'd learn how to use a camera. We would learn how to use a little bit of, you know, how to upload a podcast, how to edit something in GarageBand or Audacity or whatever software has you. It doesn't matter. They're learning. And from here, we, you know, we, we got, again, the video boot camp and everything else like that. So we were building to this all, all the time. This is just another example of a, you know, a local history project. I imagine you have a local history project. If not, I imagine you're thinking about a local history project. Um, how can you build in the tech training, not the tech training to do the project, the project, and then bring the tech training? If you get if you get my drift. Yes, this was another example just in how reflecting on the video stuff. We did tours of the library, and this was another chance to really encourage people to really you know work on focusing their message, and then how to stand and talk, you know how to work on your you know your elevator speech. How do you talk about the library? How do you talk about the areas that you're really responsible for and passionate about? And you know by putting them on camera and putting them you know it really drove home. You know, just the way it, you know the idea of how how people present themselves. You know, I don't I don't want to rehash some of the other stuff from video boot camp, but that was just right. just another example of, of things we've done. Likewise, we've taken the same approach with with our roving. Um, we, we're we're starting to implement roving here at Skokie with people walking around with tablets to do service. You know, of course, we have patrons. You know, more and more patrons are bringing in their own devices, and I call them campers. Yeah, you know, they'll come in. They'll plug into the outlet. They'll spread out their books on a table. They'll they'll lay out their you know at least one device, whether it's a laptop or a tablet or a phone or some combination of the three. And you know they're certainly not going to get up to come see us because they don't want to lose their stuff or more more their importantly spot, yeah. their spot the outlet the right. wonderful wonderful outlet. And so you know that model of waiting for people to visit us at the reference desk just doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So we've been getting people. You know, we've been trying to walk around and kind of and, and show people that we're available um, by having by having the tablet. You know, it's it's helped me. You know, I've been able to like get people in study rooms. I've been able to do some research. I've been able to pull materials from the shelf. Right. Um, and you know, you, you've seen this. You know, other libraries have really gone in to much bigger degrees. Right. Um, there's a library in Helsinki that hired you know that talked with like local actors. To show them like how to walk, like how your body language <laughs> conveys being available and open, and that was I thought that was kind of fascinating. But one of the ways we've kind of, you know, because you definitely run into that. You'll walk around, and yeah. if you're just buried in your tablet or just right. kind of walking to do your or class, you're walking fast, right? Right. People aren't going to be as inclined to. So you really have to work. So I've been encouraging people to really listen and try to find people who are doing interesting stuff. Well, bringing this back to learning, right. we're making people walk around with tablets, and they could get any sort of question about a tablet because you're an expert on a tablet. Right. And and so they have to learn the iPad. Right. And and now our everyone's coming in and asking for iPad 101 classes. It's not just ebook 101 classes. It's iPad one because every yeah. ebook 101 class on an iPad is an iPad 101 class. Yeah. So we've got it, we have an expertise of yeah. It's it's building organically. Right. But the with the listening, you know, we identify people like Carolina here, who is actually what she that project is is actually the background to a website she was building. Isn't that hilarious that she came back? And so you know, it it helps people to find really interesting things, and you know, just provides other context. You know, it's things we wouldn't see if had we stuck behind the desk the whole time. Right. Another thing, and this is a, a way of showing technology training or learning culture, and just you know, just integrating it into our every everyday thing. workflow. Right. So we have a statistics module. We we built a statistics module um, using Firefox as a Firefox add-on. And what this taught people that there's another web browser, um, not called Internet Explorer, which um, is only good because uh, Internet Explorer cannot always um, do what you need it to do. Um, from someone who's developed websites, I hate Internet Explorer. <laughs> but for what they learned, so okay, there's more than one browser, which is a huge step for many um, many staff members because if something doesn't work on web web browser, try a different web browser, and it works magically. And so now they're knowing, they're understanding that the, the web browsers, and then they can put the different, look different in right, browser. Right, and how yeah. the, the back, all that um, the, the code stuff, and also they learn how to add add-ons to Firefox. So we got people with their weather popping up and everything else. They've learned that your browser is not something that is given to you; it's something you can build. Yeah, we built a staff a statistics module right. for logging 
you know, questions at the desk. And instead of using a Google form, which we could have totally done just a Google form, right. we did, we, our, our, one of our people built a, an add-on, and it's installed into your Firefox, um, into your Firefox yeah. um, toolbar. And, that's, and that way it's always available. Mm -hmm. but, so, you know, and then there's other things where you don't always have the skills to learn from within. And we want to talk about some of those resources. Right. Formal learning, um, we're, we do a lot. We, we also do formal learning. It's not, that, it's not all uh, holistic, you know, yeah. zen learning. We, do, we have done formal learning. And some of the tools that we've used and are online. And these, I can't, well, Linda.com is one of the resources that we've used um, a lot. And something I use for almost all my own technology training. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not joking. I do almost all my training for Linda.com. For, tech, for software, obviously hardware, you can't really learn that well through, um, through a, a website. But it, it's, it's, you can, it's, I don't know how expensive it is for everybody, but it, it can be a bit pricey for libraries. But an individual account, which you might want to get for yourself, is not too much money, 25 bucks a month or something like that. Yeah. And it has software training for all kinds of um, topics. That's, you can learn anything from uh, Photoshop. There must be 50 hours of video in Photoshop to um, eight hours on Microsoft Word 2013. And Atomic Learning is another solution very similar. I, I don't like it quite as much as Lynda.com because the, honestly the, it's not as thorough. Yeah. It's a little it's not as well fleshed out. For me, the speakers are wooden. They're okay. a little bit wooden. They, it's like they're reading. No dulcet tones. No dulcet tones, exactly. Um, another tool I mentioned uh, as we What's use. What's that obscure one you use? Uh, really yeah. obscure free one? Oh, can someone help me with this? You, YouTube? Have you guys heard of YouTube? I think I've, yes, YouTube is another yeah. um, obscure technology training tool that we use all the time. And it, you'd, you'd be amazed at how many like very specific questions have like these walkthroughs of mm -hmm. people just recording the screen and you know letting you you know basically just follow along. Right. It's and so when my staff training when I order something we we have something like a, called a digital media lab here and so. It's a space for people to create digital media creation. So we have to support that in some, to some level. And when we buy a new software, such as like say Rocks Your Toast, or um, I don't know, something like that, we have to have a, a baseline knowledge. And that's where Lynda.com or um, most of Lynda.com or Atomic Learning have it. Have, um, it. So this is a, one of our online formal training yeah. tools. Safari Books is another Safari Books example. is another one, yeah. That's, I forgot to mention that. Safari Books is um, online books, e-books, but not downloadable, more like streaming e-books. Um, we also trained Office 2010, and we used a classroom. Sometimes you just have to use classrooms. I know for a lot of your libraries, a classroom is, uh, is not going to work if you don't have a classroom. Or if you have a classroom, you can't spread the staff for one person to teach and a bunch of pe other people to attend. But if you can do it, it's a, it, it, is a, it, it, it can work. Um, it's a little bit boring unless the instructor is good. So I, I recommend if you've got an, the instructor, go ahead and um, you know, make it a little bit light. Make it a learning together yeah. when you're up there. Um, it, the, the, the words of wisdom that I've heard for a teacher is not what you teach that matters. It's what they learn. Right. So if you're teaching Office 2010, what's the most important thing to learn? F1, <laughs> right? Isn't that it? Or I just misremember. Oh, but con oh, control Z. Alt control Z. Yes. Those are very important tools when you're Microsoft Word. How to how to um, download a resume template. Yeah. So what is it what they really want to learn? You know, all of this is meant to reflect that like teaching is a process. You know, like like Mick said, it's not it's not what you teach, it's how they learn. And you know, in in some cases you're the one doing the learning. We end up, you know, we teach our the number of classes we've taught has gone up, has skyrocketed in the yeah. last couple of years. And as a result, we're kind of learning the we're we're using patron demand to define what we're learning before we go into it, and tying it into existing library resources. This is a phone, a mobile phone class I did a couple of years ago. You can tell because the phone <laughs> has That's my among phone. its features is a hinge. <laughs> I've got a hinge. Uh, but the one of the reasons we wanted to do this, we had a big demand. You know, the class was full. We've offered it a few times, uh, but the it also enabled us to talk about what library services we offered toward for mobile devices. You know, we built a mobile website. We started offering text messaging mm -hmm. services. You know, we had a, a new mobile catalog, and we wanted to show all of this stuff off. And so it gives, us, it gives staff a chance for some real dedicated one-on-one -on -one time with a public who's, re who's receptive to those products that they, 
that they've been working on. Right. You know, if somebody's interested in, you know, like we had some people who got really into making a Pinterest page. So we had them teach a Pinterest class, and that enabled them to, you know, expand our audience. And we actually turned that around a little bit. Yeah. Um, one of my main tools of um, making people learn technology is that I make them teach that technology. For instance, we just hired somebody new named Michael. He's a very enthusiastic guy. I'm making him teach audio production. He's never done audio production. I'm not making him teach advanced audio production. I'm making him teach the basics of audio production. Or like Toby said, Pinterest. There's people who would say, show an interest in Pinterest, and then there's people who don't show much of an interest, and we say, you know what, you're going to, I think you need to teach a class on Tumblr. And, else for you. Right. Yeah. Or, and then eventually they learn these are picking their own topics. And, we can, and you know, because there is, you know, if a class goes nowhere, you know, you've spent several hours, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you know, eight to ten hours, you know, researching the topic, learning the ins and outs, writing slides, writing a, writing a handout, and you know, if like two people come up, you know, that's, that's a pretty, right. that, that makes it tough. So if you can really build it around things that can be replicated, you know, whether through other classes, mm -hmm. or if it's handouts that can be, that can be handed out uh, for, as a means of promoting the service that it's tied to. And along that screencasting, screencasting is a yeah. video of a computer screen, like you're basically taking a video of a computer screen in order to teach somebody an asynchronous sort of information need. And Having someone teach a uh, screencast on, for example, something like Reference USA or another database means they're going to really learn it really yeah. well. And it's good something, good thing to have new people come in who you're not quite sure are going to, you know, learn that database or whatever. Right. Another thing we started doing is one-on-one. -on -one, well, we've been doing one-on-one -on -one classes for a long time, and um, we have staff teaching tons of one-on-one -on -one classes. I think we're going to probably break over 600 to 700 one-on-one -on -one classes this year. And these are all technology one-on-one -on -one classes. This doesn't include the reference and the advisory one-on-one -on -one classes. So what, we, what I've started doing and what I'm kind of playing around with is we encourage staff. We have, a, we have a slew of stuff we teach. We teach everything from introduction of mouse to Photoshop advanced. And so staff can choose what they can teach. They can teach, I'll only teach iPad and Android, or I'll only teach, um, Microsoft Word or something like that. Well, trying to get people to level up. And I, I'm still playing around with this idea, but make it a, a gamification. Um, yeah. I mean, just put some links into it. And, you know, again, building on that process, you know, we started taking photos of people, you know, giving people these certificates mm -hmm. and then throwing them up on, you know, on our Facebook page and the other spaces. And you know, we always get this tremendous response where people go, oh, you know, welcome to the Internet. You know, right. this, you know this is a... I, think, I believe he's, what, 92? 92. This is actually yeah. a patron, not a staff member, but right. yeah, um, a culture of learning in the community. Right. But I mean, it reflects the library's overall mission mm -hmm. of you know, helping to encourage people to you know, being a platform for personal growth and community engagement. Mm -hmm. it, absolutely. Um, we're building Can I ask a new a website. Question? Sure. A question that came in is just what percentage of your staff do this or are able to or do this one to one type of training? What percentage of the staff does it? Um, that's a good question. For adult services, where most of this training takes place, um, I would say 75%. Yeah, and we're, we, we have a fairly large staff, and I, right. should, I should reinforce that. Um, we've had about, we have, what, 156 total staff members? Right. Uh, and we're a standalone location. But yeah, I mean, I'd say altogether, and it's it's probably what like thirty people, thirty people to mm -hmm. contribute to this, and not role. to mention eight or nine volunteers. Right. So we teach a lot of these classes. But the you know, and it doesn't. You don't have to scale this out so big. Right. It's, it's you know because obviously, at, particularly in smaller libraries, it's hard to get time off that. Right. If you can schedule a, you know, if you make just like you know Tuesdays at three p.m. on every other week is the one-on-one -on -one appointment window, mm -hmm. then you can actually start making some time and. You know, you may not be able to meet every to to serve everyone, but it can at least give you a a chance to get started. Yeah, and it the when you teach one to one classes, um, and when you ask staff and you say staff you're going to teach one to one classes, um, they will learn the topic before they teach the one to one yeah. class. But even if the person doesn't show up, like if if I'm if I'm telling a staff member you've got to learn Windows 8 because you're going to be teaching a class. A one-on-one on Windows 8 in, in three weeks, 
they're going to buckle down and teach it because you can't argue with patron services. I mean, yeah. just, you can argue with me about what's important and whatnot, but if a patron says, I want to learn Windows 8, we're teaching them Windows 8. Yeah. And there's just no, there's just no argument there's about it. There's a chicken and egg scenario there. You know, what comes first, the knowledge or the, or the, or the teaching? And in this sense, we're kind of doing both. Right. We're, throwing pay, we're, we're putting staff out there in the egg and forcing them to grow a beak. Right. And, and it, we make it sound more. like we're pushing people to Okay. One more follow-up question, and is it staff at all levels, you know, all classifications or job titles, is it, are all levels teaching classes doing this sort of one-to-one -one training? Yes. All levels are teaching. Well, um, not all. Not circulation. Right. It's, right now it's adult services librarians and right. the tech help right. staff. And the volunteers. Yeah. And the volunteers. Right. Um, but within adult services, that's mostly everybody. Right. One um, of the things we're looking at with this realignment is, Helping expand, to expand that. that. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't see why circulation people couldn't be teaching these, or why yeah. tech services couldn't be teaching one hours a one hour uh, uh, every two weeks or something like that. Yeah, we we have a waiting list, and as I said, we're teaching almost seven hundred. We can have a one month long waiting list for these classes because they're so popular. Right. I mean, if they have the knowledge and the demand is there, I mean, if we have patrons come in asking about Mark. Mm -hmm. You know how to edit a mark record. We definitely we could find it. somebody to to, right. to pull someone in, and that that speaks to another one of our goals, which is to kind of get to to let the library be sort of the conduit through which people can talk to one another. You know, we've really worked with that with the staff model, and we're starting to move that into some of our other classes. Um, you know, there's this kind of the appy hour, or what we're calling ours, come on, get appy, yeah. where people come in and bring their mobile devices and talk about what what they like and what they have questions about and you know it gives them a real chance to share their perspective. You know, these you know, because tablets and phones, you know, they've moved to a point where everybody has this very intimate and personal connection with their devices. You know, so it's hard to teach these in a very general sense. You know, it's like have you ever used have you ever grabbed your neighbor's phone or your, your spouse's phone and you just like, none of my apps are in the right place. Everything's <laughs> weird. The screen's too bright and like a you know Yeah. And you know, so rather than try to teach some, you know, a very homogenous, in a very homogenous, generalized way, it's more just you know, create the space and let people really talk about what they're passionate about. Because yeah. Um, you know, yeah, that same intimacy, you know, it, it leads to people developing their own creative solutions. You know, it's like, oh, if I create this folder for my apps, then I have something I can quickly, you know, all the things I access most frequently, I have in one spot. You know, so if you take advantage of this, you know, it's that other case where patrons, the people who participate, realize that they know a lot more than they, than they think they do. Mm -hmm. And it creates community as well. Yeah. And we've done this as well with some things like we had a program called Tech Munchies for a while, which was kind of a lunch program mm -hmm. uh, where people would come in and talk about, and staff members would share, you know, whatever tool they, were, they wanted to talk about. Yeah, but TED Talks. Right. TED Talks, is, um, uh, we haven't actually done that here, but I've, uh, I've heard and read about other libraries uh, during lunch hour whenever having a TED Talk meeting where they listen to a TED Talk. If you don't know what a TED Talk is, do Google it and look up um, Sugata Mitra. It's one of my favorite TED Talks where they're talking about technology, education, and design, which are what you're doing. But what, you're, what TED Talks, um, and when you say, oh, I don't have time for that, I'm like, well, maybe stop going to so many webinars, everybody. Um, but if if, it, um, if you listen to one of these 15-minute talks or 20-minute talks, you're going to be inspired to have a conversation about whatever it is, technology, education, or design, which is what we're doing um, in so many ways. Yeah. And that, that brings us to kind of the next phase is like where we're going with all of this. You know, because we've worked really hard to get people more comfortable trying new things and to you know, kind of talk with one another as opposed to just one or two people on staff being the ones who handle stuff that has flashing lights and goes ding. Mm -hmm. um, you run into a point where, you know, you know, what do you do when people start taking your, your training resources to heart? You know, you're, you're kind of becoming a victim of your own success in a good way. Right. You know, it's like once people learn that, hey, even if I don't know everything, I can look for support and tools, and, you know, I can go to YouTube and find a, a resource there. You I know, can or I can get that started. You. Right. Yeah. Um, I can create my own solutions. And you, know, you need to be able to find ways, you know, if you're a manager, to support those endeavors. And, you know, and sometimes you have to find ways to kind of cast a somewhat critical eye on what they're doing, you know, to make sure that what they're doing fits into the organization's mission. Right. You know, say like they 
someone's gotten really into Tumblr. You know, how do you determine that there's an audience for it? How do you make sure that the library can help support them in, in their efforts to speak to that audience? But beyond that, like, okay, let's say you create a Tumblr account and not many people who aren't happen to be librarians right. are following you. What is the learning goal of Tumblr? Uh, is a question as a man right. I ask myself. I have a staff member who's really into Tumblr. What's the learning goal? What's he learning by doing Tumblr? Beyond making it. Beyond yes. Yeah. Be, well, and you can animate a GIF. Yeah. That's one thing. So th that's a class. What is you can harness right. that? We'll get into what a success is. Right. And so I mean, here's some examples of ways people have taken their skills and kind of run with it. This comes from our school services coordinator. Um, she had been working really hard to you know cultivate a you know, ongoing relationship with all of the, the teachers in the five school districts we have in SCOTI. Yeah. Because we're Illinois and we're a bureaucracy on top of another bureaucracy. And she needed to create a way to, to reach them, you know, more consistently to make sure that certain instructors didn't fit, get fit in the, in, didn't fall into the gaps. So first we create a blog called Library Links, which is strictly devoted to re library resources for educators and, and parents. Um, and then we realized that a lot of the teachers, they didn't always come to the library to, to see this. So we built, we put in a WordPress module that allows us to send it out as an email. Mm -hmm. So anytime she updates it, people get like this email newsletter with, with the latest blog posts and the latest information. We're now working to, you know, we've always done teacher bags where a teacher says, comes in and says, hey, I've got a unit on ancient Egypt. Can you put together a package of books for me? Well, we're getting more and more um, e-books. Uh, a lot of the youth e-books are kind of unlimited users, so mm -hmm. they can be viewable on screen by any number of people. So we've been building, so she's been taking that to heart and building kind of digital book bags. Right. Where if there's a unit on, you know, the Revolutionary War, we can, you know, send them this list. And she's been working on this through kind of, she's been using Pinterest actually to create those lists because it's a nice, way of making it visually appealing and driving home a variety of different resources, whether it's our stuff or whether it's stuff that, you know, legitimate stuff found on the web. Right. Um, once you start getting successful, your, your staff members might want to augment themselves with cameras on their head. <laughs> um, and that's the real extreme librarianship. That's extreme experience. librarianship, which is what we're all about. It's really too bad you can't see the animated GIF right. version of this. If you go Google it or maybe we'll put out a link on Twitter. Yeah, we'll put it out. But, um, but all joking aside, like we've been saying, we're taking projects, we're augmenting them with, um, with technology. And when you've, got, when you've done everything and you've been successful and people are, are really learning, they're going to start augmenting them, their own um, projects with technology, such as our uh, Holly Jen, one of our, um, who did a text Yeah, that's right. She did, she did, did a webinar. She did um, Where's Thumbkin YouTube, and it's got, what, 30,000 yeah. views on it. It's like one of the go-to, you know, finger plays. It's a definitive there. Where's Thumbkin right. in the world, which is amazing. Yeah. And this is what we should be doing. Yeah. So uh, augment. So that's, that's kind of how these things kind of feed into one another, and there's a, there's a cycle to this process mm -hmm. of, you know, once you're comfortable with learning, you can start building it into other, you know, existing library services or create new library services. And become extreme. It. That's right. So we'd like to kind of, you know, we want to leave time for questions. So we'd like to kind of wrap up with some of the like core concepts that bring, you know, we've got to earn our keep as liberal arts majors, right. like Mick and I do. So we want to bring it back to the, uh, you know, the concepts. Oh, look, someone on Twitter found the link. Excellent. Nice. Thank you, Lisa. Good for Lisa you, Jay. Um, first thing, you know, it's kind of leap then look. We've been talking about a lot of these, you know, sometimes the only thing that's keeping people back is just, you know, the fact they haven't tried it. Right. You know, we've had these classes where, you know, people are learning how to do it, you know, sometimes the week before or even the day before or in my case sometimes the hour before. <laughs> I need to plan better. Right. Um, but, you know, it's this months. chance, you know, the, the, the more you get used to this stuff, the, the quicker you realize how much it builds on itself. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly with like mobile, mobile devices and things like that, there's an intuition that's built into a lot of these projects. And knowing that things like control Z, the undo button, right. is more or less a universal command across every piece of software. Or like I mentioned with screencasting, if you learn screencasting, you have Automatically, well not automatically, but you have learned audio production and video production. Yeah. And uh, you've learned it. You just have. Right. One, so, go ahead. Oh, no, good. Okay, one of the other things, one of the other rapid fire trades is who is your a key person? Who are some of your key persons? Who are, I call them the Pollyanna, the people who are going to be positive about change, about tech training. 
And if you can't name the person off the top of your head right now, then maybe you're that person, which is great. But you've got to, you gotta, you gotta, and it doesn't, I'm not talking about department heads. I'm talking about people like I mentioned before, Sophie. Yeah. Um, people who, who make the cookies. Yeah. People like that. Who, who, who are the you, connectors? Who do you need to get going on this? Who do you really need yeah. to work on? Identify them, work on them. Sometimes it's going to be the same person all the way through, and sometimes it's going to be someone who, you, once you introduce the project, they take to it, right. and they realize that it's something that they really like, that they, that they really want to do. And you can build on that enthusiasm, use that as a way of demonstrating, you know, again, context for how this works. Right. And your key people are not Toby and Mick. Right. Like, we are already on board. It's right, yeah. Yeah, like, get us on board, as, but we're, we're already halfway there. We're already, we were there yesterday. Right. <laughs> now, one thing that you've got to know about is failure. Um, yes. Failure begets improvement. You've got to be willing to, you know, essentially fail fast. Right. You know, if something, if a project doesn't go wrong, if a project doesn't work, Take the time to reflect on it and mm -hmm. ask yourself, well, is there something here that we did learn from it that we can harvest? What can we change to make the next time we try something like this function and, well? And be willing to admit failure. Like, don't pin failure on people um, right. out loud. But um, don't, like, try to learn from your failure. Like, for example, there's a baseball team in Chicago named the Chicago Cubs <laughs> who does not generally improve from failure. But there's a baseball team and where you might have heard of the you might have heard of my favorite team, the Boston Red Sox. And they and have they learned from you know, last to first. So right. you know, there's there are you know, people can iterate right. and move along. Um, and then finally we just want to you know, you have to treat this all like a process. You know, whenever you introduce a new thing, it's not like, you know, this is going to be the same all the way throughout. You know, you're going to make it change. You might iterate it. You might phase it out altogether and introduce a new learning module. You know, like the same way, you know, Delicious faded. Right. Um, but you if, know, you delicious, if, you, being, yeah. but if you learn Delicious, but if you learn Delicious, you knew tagging. You're right. You knew, yeah, you learned a whole bunch. There is no endpoint. Yeah. Right. And it's, you know, again, it's all about building a really strong positive attitude toward learning. Mm -hmm. And then once you have that, you can really start, you know, you can tackle anything. Right. So that's kind of our spiel. Right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, this is, you can get in touch with our adorable children if you like, or, you know, go through our, our contact information there. Yeah. But we wanted to leave some time to take your questions, because I know there's lots of specific instances where, you know, smaller libraries or libraries with different um, organizational structures or, you know, certain people can raise certain questions. Okay, well that was great, and I do have a lot of questions from the audience, so let's just start going through some of them. One of Excellent. them is just tech resistance, and you, you talked mm -hmm. about staff doing teaching or requiring people to teach. Um, do you run into resistance there, and how do you, what's your advice for tech resistance in dealing with that? I've been thinking about this a lot, and yeah, it was like, um, because, um, <laughs> but one of the things I've done is that you've got to Imagine a bank account, and you've got to put money in the bank account and then take deposits from the bank account. So when I'm helping somebody with a printer jam, when I'm helping people with these tech problems, I'm putting money in that bank account, and they have to understand that I'm going to take money out of that bank account eventually, and that we're going to ask them to learn something. And the, some people won't see it this way, and I hate to say it, some people, if you really have a toxic person on your staff, and you have the ability to let them go. You've got to let them go. <laughs> There's, yeah, I mean, exactly. There's, w some people, they're going to get it. Some mm -hmm. people are going to need some coaching, and they're going to need to see like, what context, you know, what, what's the bigger picture about learning about you know, an e-reader. You know, the fact that the, fact that the, the way people are reading are, is changing. You know, why do we need to teach people how to use tablets? Right. Because they're not coming to the desk anymore. You know, if you can put it in that context, that can help. But, you know, there's, there are going to be people who, you know, just they, you know, they'll refuse to do anything. And there's, there's a point where you have to kind of say, you know, you need to do the, you know, this is part of your job. Right. And we're very lucky because our, the administration of our organization is very supportive of this. Mm -hmm. um, but we have worked at other organizations we're not quite as supportive. And sometimes you just, you just got to kind of, like Toby said, leap. And then, yeah. or, what's the saying? Ask for forgiveness, not permission. Yeah, beg for, for yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Easier have, to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. 
Have you added, have job descriptions actually been changed to make um, teaching or training part of the roles or responsibilities for staff? Welcome to my life, everybody. This is, yes, Nick. Um, this is the realignment. We're realigning. Total. Right, we are realigning because we see learning and um, community and other th access and, as vital and they need to be their own departments. They can no longer be dovetailed into children's adults or whatever. It's going, and I'm sure we'll be doing the, 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 a talk about this. And yeah, there'll be a lot of crossover right. between you know, where just the concept of learning you know, spiders into adult services right. and youth services and uh, you know, the computer lab and circulation and you know, all of those things. Right. And we're, it's not just us. It's like the NEC Library, our high, our Memorial Public Library, I'd look at them, talk to them about it. Yeah. There, there's a lot of libraries that uh, we're seeing that learning is going to be something that butters our bread, so to speak, forever. Yeah, to take a more flexible approach right. to all of this. So does that answer the question? Yeah, I think, I think that it, it does. You know, it's, we knew that question would come. That's something that, that always comes up with this topic, and that's a good, good response. I think your whole presentation has given a lot of good ideas. Um, Mick, can I ask you to type the name of that TED Talk speaker into the chat? People were asking, and I didn't catch it either. Um, okay, you got. Uh, yeah, the TED uh, Talk. You said there was one that you really recommended. Did someone on tweet that? Technology um, learning, or did someone tweet it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, another question is, do you use volunteers for training, and if so, do, you, do they get training on how to be trainers? Uh, yes, for the first part. What do you say about the second? Uh, do they get trained to be trainers? Um, we have them sit in classes um, uh, by experienced trainers, and um, so yes, they do get training. They, we're, we're not, if you're coming in and you're asking to be a technology trainer, um, generally, we're, we're pretty safe, and I, I do it. We interview them to make sure that they, yeah. they we interview them, and it's a serious interview, maybe a 20 minute interview, to see who they are and um, what they're, what they're going to be all about. And we have them sit in cl a couple classes, and if they keep coming back, then we know they're going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, a volunteer with a, a six month shelf life, MLS students are wonderful volunteers. Yeah. Um, if you're near any library school, or now it's all online library schools, hit up San Jose or whomever the um, North Texas, whomever, recent college graduates from non-library departments. Right. If there's somebody who's, if there's somebody with a graphic design department, and there are people working, you know, it's like, it's going to take them a while to find a job within their field, and they, you can kind of set up some mutual exploitation where they can build their portfolio mm -hmm. and do stuff while they're, you know, while they're looking for. And teacher retirees have been very useful as well. People yeah. who were instructors at some point or teachers, and they were retired now. Have been very have have come in, and they've worked out wonderfully. Yeah, absolutely. And I, they could teach me about teaching. So, <laughs> yeah, and, and that really goes a long way. Good. What else do you have? Pri um, this is something you mentioned early on, Toby, was prioritizing and how you have to prioritize. And then it came up with technology mm -hmm. training, for example. How do you decide? what classes you're going to teach, or how do you decide what, what you're going to prioritize when there are just so many yeah. possibilities? Well, I mean, no matter how many libraries, uh, no matter the size of your library, you know, you're going to run in, you're going to always want to do more mm -hmm. than you're capable of doing. Um, I'm a really big fan of, there's, a, there's an exercise from web design called Divide the Dollar, where basically you make a big list of everything you want to do, and then you get all the stakeholders involved. So it could be the staff members who are doing training, or it could be your public. And you say, okay, you each have you know, like three votes, or you know, divided all, you have 10 votes. So you have like 10 cents a piece. And then you, you, you vote on which things you want. And very quickly it helps to identify where, where the actual demand is, or so what it is that people want to know about. And you know, it also helps you, you know, in some cases it means the thing that wasn't the clear favorite, you know, oftentimes it's like, everybody's second choice is overwhelmingly more popular than everyone's first choice. Right. So it's, you know, and, and that can also help you make a plan. You know, say, you know, I can only do three you know, classes on three different topics. I know what the first three are very obviously are, but then I have an inkling as to what the next set might right. be. Okay, good. 
Let's see, we're getting a lot of questions and discussion about technology skills and competencies and you know, finding those for job descriptions, finding those to use in assessment. And I'll throw that back out to the, to the participants in today's session too. Just what resources are you aware of for assessing competencies? And the EDGE initiative people have mentioned is one resource, but if you have anything to add to that, Toby and Mick, that would be great too. But that's lots of discussion around that. Jean says Web Junction, yeah, they've done a lot of work with pulling together um, competencies. Good. Sure. Yeah, I mean, for us, we've kind of started working on it. It hasn't quite coalesced, right? Because it keeps changing so quickly. Right. And so, you know, it's you know, a, you know, asking, creating a job description where it says, you know, you know, Photoshop and InDesign and these things that could change in two years. Right. You know, like the way it, the the way the Adobe Creative Suite change. So, you know, we're really more interested in finding people who have, you know, the open mind about doing stuff and right. knowing that. If I give them a task, they're, you know, it might take them some time to figure it out, but they're definitely capable of filling it out. So we're always testing people, and it's not like official tests, but we're always testing people who say, hey, create a poster about these new drums that we're going to circulate. Yeah. And I want to see how they're, what they're going to do, how long it's going to take them to get it back to me, what it's going to look like, their design skills, because I'm, I'm not a design expert, but I, I, I kind of know what I like. And leave it open-ended. Are we going to ask me a bunch of questions? Or are we going to do it by themselves and just get me something real quick? And you really do learn quickly, um, like who are your learners? Yeah. Who are they, who's going to teach themselves? Good. So when when we have when we advertise for a job, um, we, we you know we and I know every state is different, but we advertise for a job when we have those bullet points of has audio knowledge. I don't almost never do I have specific programs on there. But I put down something like graphic design ability. Yeah, more and more general. Stuff. Right. Okay. Well, we have one more question. I do want to mention to those of you, this is the top of the hour, and if you need to leave, that's just fine. Remember, we are sending you a, a follow-up message today with the recording and slides and any links that were shared. So we'll have that. The last question that I have, Toby and Mick, is just about outreach and marketing and what you've done to bring people into your technology programs. Do you have a little bit? Um, not technology training related, but you've just mentioned so many great programs throughout the session. Any special mm -hmm. things you've done with outreach and marketing? Um, I mean, yeah, that's another one of those. This is water thing. Right. Like we're very, you know, we're very driven toward making sure our our message is out in as many places as possible. And you know, we we work on we focus a lot on community partnerships. You know, we have a lot of area organizations that you know most most um, full time staff have a working relationship with at least one group, mm -hmm. and we really try to leverage that. You know, the just the, the the personal networking to help identify other people who might be a good match for a particular program. But then, you know, beyond that, we have our traditional marketing mix. We have a newsletter. We have you know Facebook, robust social media yeah. stuff. You know, it's so it, that really varies. I mean, that's almost the whole other webinar, to right. be honest. It, and it is, a, it's, and we we don't like I said, there's no silver bullet for that either. We yeah, we struggle getting the word out about our programs. Some of our programs we think are great ideas, and five people sign up, and we're like, what? Um, so, it, there's no silver bullet on that. Um, but more the better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, we do talk to a lot of community groups, like Toby said. I'd go talk to Kiwanis or. Yeah, or the chamber, or, or, or you know, yeah. make your pick. Yeah. Well, I know we're at the end of our session, and we're getting rave reviews in the chat. So good job, Toby okay. and Nick. This has been really useful, very interesting, very useful. And I thank you so much for sharing your time and experiences with everyone. Again, we do this every month, and next month we're going to be talking about assistive technology. So hope to. See you again on November 20th, and we'll talk about that, which is benchmark 11. We'll include info in the follow-up email on that too. And we want to thank ReadyTalk for being our webinar sponsor today. There is an evaluation form that will pop up as we close out of the session, so please take some time and let us know what, what you liked and what you would like us to do in the future. So again, thanks so much, Toby, and thank you, Mick. This has been great, and thank you everyone for your questions and resources. And We'll call it a wrap. Yeah. Thank you guys Thank for you. being a great audience.